So yeah, zero to everywhere with MVC. Uh, so I'm going to be talking mainly about MVC3, which is, the, which is in RTM, so you can use this in production systems and so on. Um, after I first devised and started writing this talk, uh, the build event happened, and uh, Phil Hack ruined everything by introducing the developer preview of MVC4, which does most of the stuff I'm going to show you out of the box, which is really annoying, because it means you don't have to do most of this stuff anymore. But I think it's really important to understand with some of these things exactly how it works and how it fits together, so you can understand what's happening um, and how to improve it to, you know, to fit what you're doing. So, um, look, we'll start off. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is three main things. I'm going to talk about why we're doing this anyway. Why are we targeting mobile devices? I'm sure I don't really need to sell that point too much to you guys, but it's worth mentioning um, you know, up front anyway. Um, I'm going to look at going from zero to an MVP, which I'll get to in a sec, um, using MVC. So it's really quick. MVC is really quick for spinning something up from scratch um, and getting something that's usable and workable. Um, and there are certain occasions when this kind of stuff is really useful to be able to just, here's a fully fledged application, go nuts. Um, and then finally, we'll look at targeting the mobile devices themselves and the different techniques um, you can do for that. So, why target mobile devices? Um, like I said, I'm sure I don't have to sell that point to you, but um, I just like a quick show of hands. Who, who's involved in writing web apps or web accessible applications at the moment? So quite a few people. Out of those people, um, put your hand up if you actually explicitly target mobile devices. And I'm not just talking about mobile phones, I'm talking about iPads and other tablets and you know, Windows phones and things like that. Okay, so maybe half of the people who said um, they were doing you know, um, web devices, which is a lot more than average, really. Um, I'm, I'm constantly amazed by how few people um, target mobile devices or at least give a decent um, response to a mobile device, to visiting a site on a mobile device. Um, and the statistics are very much in favour of, um, you know, of doing this work to make sure that mobile devices can deliver you a decent a decent response. I don't know about you guys, but personally, if I go to a website on my mobile phone, which is almost as much as on a PC, and I sit at a desk all day, so if I go to a site that's painful for mobile phones, I ought to really want to be on there to stay there. Otherwise, I'll just say, this, screw it, this is too hard. I'll throw it away. And you're going to lose a lot of people unless you, unless you target this kind of thing. And it's becoming more and more important. So. This is, this is a statistic from September 2010, so it's more than a year ago. 36%, um, so it's a bit more than a third of Australians access the internet on their mobile phone. Um, and that's people who had accessed the internet on their mobile phone within the last 30 days. So it's people who are actively using it. 13% um, um, said that they accessed the internet on a non-mobile phone uh, mobile device, so a tablet or something like that. And Australia's a little bit slow in these things. As I said, this is September 2010, so God knows what the statistics are now. I actually struggled to find some good ones. Um, in the US, um, there's about 65 or so percent of people say they've got a smartphone or some kind of smartphone. And of those, 87% say they use it to access the internet, right? More than that, 68% um, of them say they do it on a typical day. So almost every day they'll do it. Um, and 25% of people in the US um, use it primarily as the source of internet connection. So they will use their mobile phone or their mobile device as the primary way of getting to the internet, not a PC. And these trends are really, really clearly going in one direction. Um, there was an interesting talk, as I mentioned, by Phil Hack on um, MVC4. And there's a lot of stuff for mobile devices in MVC4, which I'll mention. Um, but he brought to light an interesting statistic and I thought on his slide deck he'd have the source for this, but he doesn't. So um, the, my source for that last one is Phil Hack. So blame him if it's wrong. But in some countries, it's really, really um, prevalent for people to have internet accessible mobile phones and not, not you know, um, internet devices like PCs. And in Egypt, 70% 70, 70 of people, up to 70% of people, use their mobile phone as their only way of accessing the internet. Not primary, but only way of accessing the internet. So that, I mean, these kind of statistics should really push you in that direction unless you're, um, if you're not thinking about that already. So like I said, I'm sure I didn't have to convince you of this kind of stuff. So um, the next thing is, 
yeah, sorry. This is a little thing I threw in at the last minute because this blows me away and I'm just amazed. So how many people have an iPhone as opposed to something else? Hey, it's probably less than the average person who has a smartphone, I'd say, in here. People like to hack around. You can't do that very well. So if you visit apple.com on an iPhone, you get that. That's terrible. They're putting an iPhone in every single person's hand and it's not, an, it's not a mobile site. They don't deliver a mobile site, site to their own device. I find that inexplicable. I don't understand how they can possibly do that. But there you go. Anyway, so clearly the message isn't getting through to everybody. Um, so zero to MB, MVP. So first I'll start by explaining what I mean by MVP. Um, it's not uh, most valuable person or whatever. And apparently there's a wrestler in the US called MVP. Um, that's what came up when I searched for MVP. So it's not that. It um, stands for minimum viable product. And the concept is really, it's the smallest amount of work you can do to make this a viable product. So there's, there's questionable whether this applies in this case, but I'm using it as a, as a way of saying, you know, something which does, which has all the functions that you need it to have um, to prove that this application is worthwhile. So if your boss comes to you and says, I want you to do this, it's the smallest amount of work you could get away with to, to do that. And obviously from that point, you'd build on and you build up a decent application and so on. But in a lot of cases, it's, it's really important to spin up something as quickly as you can, get it there and prove that it works. So um, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about MVP. Now, entity framework, as much as I'm sure half this room is going to go, oh, I don't like MVF. Um, it's really useful for uh, MVPs, for really quick, you know, build everything and get a scaffolded entire application running. Um, and it builds in nicely to the tooling for Visual Studio and um, is nicely bound to MVC3 and things like that as well. So you can get a lot out of the box for free without doing much work at all. And so in terms of having an, MVC, an MVP, sorry, so a minimum viable product, you can spin something up that's fully functional in a really small amount of time. Um, so I'll show you that. So here's the scenario that I'm going to go through. Um, your boss comes to you, he says, I want a little application. I just want to ask some people some surveys. Um, you know, scale of one to five, five questions. Oh, it's got to look nice on a mobile phone. And um, you have 51 minutes, which is, I think I have less than 51 minutes, actually. So. Um, he wants to see something in his hand really as quickly as possible um, and target it at mobile devices. So that's, that's how I'm aiming, aiming this thing and we'll see how we go. Um, so, number one, let's start, Visual Studio. Um, let me know if you want, to, want me to zoom in on anything. Actually, that's a really good point. Um, let me just start this. Um, let me know if you want me to zoom in on anything or if you want me to slow down. Um, I'll try not to slow down because there's a lot to get through. So I'm just going to go new project, MVC3 web application, and I'll just leave it at that because I'm going to cheat a bit later and swap over to one that I've already built just in case something goes wrong. Um, and we, want, we have three options here. So, um, oops. so we get a, um, an empty one which just builds the structure for MVC. Um, for things like this, we don't want to use that. We're, what we're going to want is an internet application which gives you forms-based authentication in there already. Um, there's an internet application which gives you um, Windows auth out of the box. So if you're building this in a corporate environment, that's a good way of doing it. And I'll show you this authorization stuff later on. It's, it's amazing what you get for free. It's pretty, pretty good. So in this case, we're going to do an uh, internet app. Um, we're obviously going to use Razor because who uses ASPX? Um, and we're going to use HTML5. Uh, I'm not going to tick this this time. Sorry, I'm not doing a right test for a demo. It'll prove when things go wrong. So it's going to click OK. So what's it, what it's going to do now is it's going to go away and it's going to scaffold um, the basics, a basic start of an MVC application. And um, you can see it, it's putting in references all over the place, and we get get all this stuff happening. There's jQuery that comes out of the box and jQuery validation comes out of the box. Um, unobtrusive client side validation as well as the server side validation. Um, and so there we go, we have this basic application. I hit a five. 
So straight away we can see what it gives you for free. And um, how many people use MVC on a regular basis? Quite a few, that's good. Um, so this is probably all bread and butter for you guys. You've probably done this 100 times. Um, but it's good, to, it's good to demonstrate this and show what it can do. So um, it's just going to spin this up on our local dev um, server. And we have an application. Um, you know, different pages. They give you a home and an about page to start off with. But as well as that, I mentioned that there's form space auth. So, um, so this is probably going to fail. Um, and it's going to take a little while. And the reason is, in the background, and this is just the first time, in the background, um, it's going to put together all the structure of the database and things like that that are required for this authentication. So we can see um, login was unsuccessful. Um, we get validation on these things as well, required fields and so on. Um, and we can register, you know, um, register an account. It gives us that, oh, yeah. Sorry, it makes you put in decent passwords as well, which is painful. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. So I'm going to register an account, and sure enough, I'm logged on, and that's great. Um, so that's, so straight out of the box, you have something you can, you can set up, you know, users, and you can do all this kind of stuff. Um, what it's using in the background, because I didn't tell it about a database, I didn't tell it about anything, it's using in the background um, the local SQL Express um, installation. So for this kind of stuff, the MVP stuff, the quick build-up of applications, this is perfect. You don't have to worry about all that plumbing and the, and the authentication authorization stuff. Um, so that's that. Any questions about that so far? This is all pretty much. You, might, you probably did this at home. You know, new project, F5, and it's done. Um, but that's great. That's just the out-of-the-box stuff. So we're, we're going to look at creating this application that my boss wants. So um, first thing to do is create some models. And this is, by the way, this is one way of doing this. Um, Entity Framework gives the ability to do code first, which personally I've never been a huge fan of. I don't mind deciding on my data structure before I start. And you can change it. You know, while you're developing it, you change it. If you are in production already, you write a script and you deploy that script and so on. Um, little plug, SSW has a product called SQL Deploy, which is awesome for stuff like that. Anyway, I'll leave that alone. Um, so data, we're going to do an entity data model. So that'll give us our um, entity framework data objects. I'm going to call this, um, actually, I'm just going to call it model one. To start. Oh, no, I won't. I'll call it survey, survey models. And we're going to add that. So now it's going to add its references to Entity Framework, and this is using EF4. Um, it's going to, well, sorry, it's not going to do that yet. You can either generate these from a database by pointing at an, at an existing database, which I don't have, or start with an empty one and build it up in, with the tooling in Visual Studio. So I'm going to do that. I find it easier to work with this, um, work this way. You build your objects um, and your structure that way, and then let it deal with the deploying it to databases. Um, so there we go. I'm just going to close this. So, right, so survey application, five questions. Um, people need to answer one to five. So we're going to add a new entity. By the way, is this clear enough to see? Kind of? Yep. All right, so add a new entity. We're going to call it survey. Um, it's entity set, so the plural is surveys. It's going to create a, a key property, auto incrementing ID. So I'm just going to say OK. So we get this object which has an ID field, not much else. So we need to add properties to it. So I'm going to add a scalar property. So it's just a single object. Uh, I'm going to call it question one. By default, it'll make these strings. It, we, I'll show you changing these in a sec. Uh, so we've got five questions. This is going to be boring for a second, um, just while I create these five questions. Um, you know what, I'm just going to do three. And then in the, when I swap over it, there's going to be five magically. Um, and we're going to give it a survey name, right? So that's great. That's the survey object. Uh, we need to create an entity for answers. So there's an answer entity. Um, and I'm just going to run through this really quickly. There's going to be an answer one. And that's going to be a int, not a, oh, I'll make it an int 16, not a string. And I'll do that twice more. 
It's exciting, this demo, isn't it, sometimes? Uh, and that's going to be an int as well. Um, we'll put a name of the person who um, well, answered by, and we'll put a date that this was answered as well. So, and that'll be a date time. Right, so now we have our structure. Uh, the relationship between a survey and a um, answer needs to be established. So we'll add a new association. And it gives us this dialog which tells us how to add an association between these two entities. Um, it's guessed the entities. There's only two, so it's not, a, not hard to guess. Um, and it's going to assume at the moment, it's got it right, uh, that a survey can have many instances of answer. Um, as much as these little drop downs and stuff are, are useful, I always just jump straight to this and read it. And if it makes sense, then save that. But the other things which are useful here are um, sorry, that we get a navigation property on both ends. So what that means is you'll be able to say survey.answers and it will give you a collection of the answers. So um, same thing on the other side. You have an answer and it will say answer.survey and it gives you the survey object itself. Um, now, when you're writing queries in Link, which I'm addicted to now, and I'm struggling to go back to SQL when I need to, um, it, it delivers you an object tree of everything that you need. So you're dealing with pure objects when you get these things back, rather than tables of data. So if I wanted to get all surveys, I'd just say, give me all the surveys, and then for each of those surveys, I can say survey.answers, and it will give me the collection of answers as well. You have this, this tree of the objects. So that's really useful, and this is how it does it, the navigation properties. The other thing it'll do is it'll add a foreign key property to the answer entity, because the answer has to have a survey ID, the same with the database and so on. So it's going to go ahead and do that for me. And you can see the survey ID has been added, the survey navigation property, and the answer navigation property. Right. So we have our objects. There's a little warning that pops up. Doesn't make any difference. Um, now, with our authentication stuff, uh, MVC knew exactly what the structure of this stuff was. It's a standard ASP.NET authentication model. So it knows how to build it. It knows where to put it. Um, it'll actually create in your web config a, um, an entry here called application services. Um, and it'll put the connection string of a local SQL, SQL Express one. So when you do your authentication, that's where, it, that's where it's going to put its data. But this here is our data. And it doesn't know how this, how this is structured because we've just built this thing up. So we're going to need to put this in a database. We're going to need to tell it where to store this data. So the tooling for Entity Framework lets us generate a database from the model. So we define the model, generate the database. Um, I need to give it a database connection. So I'm not going to use the same application service as one, although I could. Um, I'm going to say SQL Express. Um, I'm just going to use Windows Auth and so on, and I'm going to call it um, uh, MVC Application 2. Uh, ask me whether I want to create it, and I do, obviously. And it generates me this, sorry, it generates me this connection string, which um, is an entity framework connection string. So it contains your SQL Server connection string or whatever you're using and so on, but it also contains details about the schema itself. So um, I'm also going to get it to save, save the entity connection string in web config so I don't have to worry about it because this is a really quick you know, example. And say next, and it's going to build me a DDL, so a, um, a script basically to create the entire database for me, which is great. So I end up with a script. I still have to run that script, so I'm just going to do that over that SQL Express database. And everything completed successfully. And now I have my objects, and I have my data schema, and they know how to talk to each other. And so right off the bat, I can start adding objects in code and so on. So there we go. So we have our database. Um, and everything is wonderful. Of course, we've got no pages that show us these surveys or anything like that. And this is where some of the real power of the um, tooling between uh, the link between MVC and Entity Framework comes in, that we can do this really quite easily. So um, 
I saw a lot of hands go up for MVC, so we're just going to create a controller. Hopefully, you know what that means. Um, if you don't know how MVC fits together, I'm sorry, I'm not going to cover it here. Um, but a controller does all the work behind the scenes to deliver a view, basically. So I'm going to make a survey controller. And here is what we get with Entity Framework. So we can see by default, it's told us the template that it's going to use is a controller with read, write actions and views using Entity Framework, right? So what this will do is it will create all of our CRUD operations and our CRUD pages, or the views, and it will put them all in the application to start off with without us having to do anything. Obviously, we have to tell it what model to use, so I'm just going to choose survey. And we've got to tell it where to get its data. And now this is the connection string we mentioned before, and it's saving that um, to the web config, the, the connection details there. The actual object itself gets generated when you create those models. So we have a survey models container, or survey, yeah, survey models container object. And that tells it how to connect to the database, how to do that kind of work. So I'm going to click add. It's going to, it's going to go away, and it's going to scaffold a whole lot of stuff for me. And then I'm going to hit F5. So as much as I hate the line, I haven't written a single line of code, which is horrible. I'm going to, I hit another key. <laughs> um, what did I do? OK. My bad. Control Z. I couldn't even see what I did. Um, so we've got this same, uh, same page will come up. Um, nothing's going to look different off the bat because we don't have any links to our survey stuff. But if we change the URL and visit the survey action, then we have an index, a list of all the surveys. Of course, we don't have any surveys yet. Um, so we can create a new one. We can fill in the details. Uh, I don't know. And session three. And this is going to be called session. Yeah, something like that. Create it, and it appears in our list. We can look at the details. We have them. We can edit the details. Um, and we get all of this stuff out of the box. What we also get is um, validation out of the box I mentioned. However, Entity Framework, at least on this machine and the other machines I've used, has a little bit of a problem with null strings. Um, when I leave that you know, alone and save it, it's going to crash and say, oh, sorry, you can't set this to a null value. Because what the form is doing is it's, um, it's not posting anything back in that field. And in the back end, it's interpreting that as that field doesn't even exist. Not it's an empty string, but it doesn't exist. Entity, Fra Entity Framework has a little bit of a problem with this with the uh, Entity Framework built objects. Now, I would encourage you, if you're using MVC, not to ever use the out of the straight out of entity framework objects. Use view models. So create your model or your view model that's specific to the view that you're giving the user and put attributes on those views for validation and for things like that. So you can build up these objects that are really specific to a page. And then when you get them back in the controller, massage them and convert them into actual objects and do your updates and your saves that way. Um, the reason is you can, isolate your, um, you can isolate your validation and your rules, like this is a mandatory field, this has to be between 1 and 10, for example. You can do that in isolation from the actual database itself. Um, you can do that in the view models themselves, just by applying the attributes to view models themselves. Or what you can do is you can have um, meta, uh, sorry, meta, class, uh, meta classes, basically, that say, um, look, I'm the meta object, sorry, I'm the meta details for this view model over here. So you have your object and you have a separate class which defines your, your details about what's mandatory and, and so on. I'm not going to go into that in too much detail here because there's a whole, whole hour session on that by itself if I wanted to go down that route. Um, so what we've got really, apart from that little bug, what we've got really is a almost fully fledged application built without really writing any code. Um, does everybody remember, I say remember, people are probably still using it, um, dynamic data? No? Yes? Maybe? 
Yeah. So it almost gives you that kind of um, system. What dynamic data did is you basically pointed it at a database and said, build me an application. And it did all these CRUD pages and stuff like that for the data that you're pointing at, which was really useful for this spin up an application, which is just a forms over data thing. Um, the trouble is it did it all on the fly, basically. If you wanted to override the appearance of anything, then you had to write a new version of it and you know, use convention to make sure that this page was in the right spot and so on. So this does all that, but it scaffolds it all and it builds these pages for you, so you have complete control. So these views are just views. I can change what's in them, I can change the text, I can do whatever I want with these views. I can change what's passed to them and so on. So I have full control over this code. It's just that what it gives you out of the box is, is pretty compelling. So um, what I'm going to do, so we have these CRUD operations, right, but there's no way of somebody answering a survey. So I'm going to add a new answer um, action on the survey controller. I'm just going to increase the font size. So bear with me, I'm actually typing this live rather than snippets. I've got snippets later. But, um, so we're going to call that action result um, answer. And it's going to pass in an, oops, uh, an ID. So all it's going to do is it's going to create a new um, object. So um, a new answer equals new answer. Um, and we're going to say the survey object. Remember, this is the navigation property. We can say the survey object equals uh, from our database surveys.single um, and an expression saying the ID must equal the ID that was passed in. Oops. Hopefully, that kind of code isn't too foreign to you. It's just using um, an expression. So it's basically using um, linked to entities essentially to pull back that survey object creates a new answer object and assigns that to it. So finally, we want to return the view passing in that answer object. Now, what happens if the survey doesn't exist for that answer? Why does the survey, sorry? What happens if there's, if there's not a survey with that ID? If there's not a survey with that ID, it will fall over and do horrible things. So I'm not putting any error checking around this because it's a really quick demo. Obviously, you check that that was the case and um, that the survey was there and do your error handling and return a page saying it's not there and so on. But just for the purposes of this demo, I'm going to write terrible code. Um, good old ReSharper as well has told me that that view doesn't exist. So the latest versions of ReSharper understand MVC really well, um, which is great. Um, so first off, I'm going to create this view. So um, this is Visual Studio stuff, not ReSharper. So I just add a view. Um, it's an answer. The name is answer. I'm going to say that this is strongly typed. It's strongly typed to the answer model. And the scaffolding, again, gives me what I wanted. So this is like a cut down version of what it was doing before when I said build me everything. This is building me a specific thing. So I'm saying I want a create model. Sorry, a create view for this model. Um, so I'm going to add that, it's going to create the view, and it's going to stick everything in there. So what I can do is when I press F5, I will get the, uh, I'll get the answer. Sorry, I'll get the same page as I did before. Obviously, I still don't have a link to the survey item, but I can do survey. It'll give me my list of surveys. Um, there's no link to the answer one. This will all come when I cheat and build one up and, and open one that I've saved previously. But if I answer survey um, number one, we get this behavior. So we get a, a create page. Um, and it's the same thing. You can, you know, mandatory fields um, give you, you know, errors and so on if you don't have them in there and, and all that kind of stuff. So we have the same behavior that we did before. Um, it's, just, it's just built up against the survey response now. Now, to complete this, obviously, I'd do a post. Um, an HTT post version of that um, action, which would take the answer object, um, check it, save it to the database, and so on. So just because I'm very quickly running out of time, and there's a lot of stuff I want to go through, I've, there's one that I've prepared earlier. So I'm going to do that. All it's doing, I haven't added much to it as well. There's nothing tricky at all. Um, it's just giving me 
the rest of this behavior, so the answer one. The other thing that it's doing is on my survey page, it's just put in another column there saying this is how many have answered, and in my details page, it's telling me what the average is for each, each of those options. So when I open that, you'll see that behavior. Um, but hopefully this has given you an idea of what kind of stuff you get out of the box. Like I haven't written very much code, um, and I can, I still have full control over the code, but the scaffolding and entity framework and so on makes you, it lets you get from, a, you know, from the zero to the minimum viable product pretty quickly for your internal applications. Now, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, really quick spun up prototype applications in some organizations have a tendency to become live, used by everybody, running off Brian's old PC, which is sitting underneath that desk over there. So, you know, it, it's good for demonstrating behavior, it's good for spinning something up really quickly, but it's, it's worthwhile making sure that people understand that this is just a, you know, this is the first version of the thing, this is, you know, just demonstrating what it can do and so on, but still, out of the box, this is quite a compelling thing, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of control over what we get. So, targeting mobile sites. There are three ways that I'm going to talk about um, doing this, and really there's four. Option zero is don't do anything. Let the person deal with whatever you deliver them. Um, and look, that's an option. It's a legitimate option. Auction. A legitimate option. I'm going to have some water. It's really cheap to not do anything. Um, you don't get the best results, but you know it's really up to you whether it's whether you think it's worth your while doing some of this stuff. So. Here's that one. Um, one thing that's really quick and easy but doesn't always give you great results is um, viewport meta tags, which I'll have a look at. Um, getting a little bit more complicated, we, have, we can have a look at CSS media queries. So CSS3 gives you the ability to target um, device properties, really. So things like the size of the window or the size of the device. Um, for some of these devices, you can choose do this if it's landscape or portrait. So you can, you can target this stuff with, just with CSS. Um, the good thing about uh, most smartphones and um, things like tablets and, and that kind of stuff is because they're all new devices, the um, browsers in them tend to support HTML5 and CSS3. So you don't have to worry about your IE6 situation where you have to give it a you know, reduced experience. If it's targeted the at the mobile device, it's probably going to support everything you need to do this. And finally, the final way of doing it is really based on user agent sniffing. So it's what device is getting this page, now I'm going to target my result to that device. So viewport meta tags. So this is a really quick way of um, doing this kind of stuff. I'm going to close this solution like I said I would before. Um, and I'm going to open up the one that I prepared earlier called DDD Survey. Um, I'm not just cheating because of this. There are a couple of things I need to do to get these um, mobile devices over here to actually see, see them. So um, I've spun up a little ad hoc wireless network. Please don't hack it. Um, and so we can see Oh, I'm going to move this. So we can see that's what we get. So we get a very similar page to what we got before. Um, it's not ideal. It's hard to press the buttons. It's hard to read the text, that kind of stuff. So um, it's not the best. You don't get the best result, really. So um, similarly, the iPad's obviously going to be a bit better um, because it's a bigger device. But you get a similar kind of story there. You can see what that's doing, right? Um, so what we want to do is just change the, uh, the header of these things. So this works, uh, MVC works with a layout file generally, which is the same as a, you know, a master page or something like that in ASPX. Oh, sorry, in ASP.NET. Um, and basically it's your template. So the really quick thing you can do is include a meta tag inside your um, header. And what this does is um, it talks to the browser's um, to the browser's viewport. So the viewport is um, is a concept really where 
It's very similar to a viewport out of a spaceship or something like that. You have this gigantic scene, right, and you have this small amount of space that you can view it. So you can either just see this much of this entire screen, or you could shrink it all, or you could see a certain amount. But what you can do with these viewport tags is say, I want you to turn all this stuff here as best you can, reflow it into this viewport. Like, this is my viewport, this is what you have to use. So the typical way, or the typical thing you add is this line here. So, so um, the name of this meta tag is viewport. Every time I turn this into a snippet, it switched it around. I always write name first and then the, the content, but it flips it around. Um, so the name is viewport, so it's telling the browser, you know, this is the viewport. It's saying the width of this page is going to be the, the width of your device. So if it's this big, that's the width of your page. That's what you have to deal with. It's also going to say, look, your initial scale, so how much you zoom things in and out, is going to be one. So that's the size. So if I have a 12-point font, show me it in 12-point. So don't do any zooming. Don't do any of that sort of stuff. So that one line there, I'm just going to run it here. You'll see that there'll be no, no real change in the browser, uh, in the local browser. But on these devices, um, there's a big change that happens. You get, a, you get a much better experience on these. I'm going to 10 past, right? So I better rush through this a bit. So I've just refreshed. It's refreshing um, on the mobile. And we can see now we've got a much more touchable you know, device. We've got big buttons. The text is the right size. It's refloated into a nice, nice picture there. And on our um, iPad, there's probably not going to be too much difference. Oh, great. So we may have lost the iPad. All right. I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to stick with the mobile phone. So there we go. Mobile phone. Looks a lot nicer. Um, we can touch the buttons. We can read the text. You know, that's, that's really what we want. So you saw just with that one meta tag, that's what we get. Now, that viewport meta tag, there's a lot more you can add to this. Um, you can tell it uh, the height if you really want. You can tell it um, whether it's going to be user scalable. So that means can the user pinch and zoom in and zoom out. And um, most devices like this will obey that, particularly iPhones um, and iDevices. Um, you can tell it it's minimum scale and it's maximum scale. So um, iPads and iPhones have a tendency, if you turn them on landscape, they'll keep the zoom that they had before. So um, you can tell it, look, your maximum, or sorry, your maximum scale is one. So don't, don't like, you know, shrink it for me. So, um, yeah, so that, without doing very much at all, has really, you know, given a little bit of a decent result. Now, obviously the pros of doing it this way, it's the least effort. Um, unfortunately, it gives you less than perfect results. This is a contrived example because MVC is structured in such a way that it is going to be nice, right? So, um, yeah, it doesn't work so well for every page, particularly if you've got a image banner that's 600 pixels wide, it's not going to do that very well. Um, one other downside is you're sending exactly the same content to your mobile phone, which might be connected over a mobile network. So if you were sending all of these gigantic pages and images and stuff like that, you're still sending that information. It's just that it's trying to reflow it in a way that's a bit better. So that's not the ideal situation if you want to keep the payload down. Um, so. One thing that you'll notice with this as well, yeah, I love that picture. One thing that you're going to notice as well is if I go to this survey page, you know how we had the table of surveys? Um, can you see that? No. There we go. That's our table of surveys. So tables tend to break this. You can't really reflow a table terribly well, right? So that's another downside as well. 
Um, so next thing we're going to look at is CSS media queries. So um, the best way I recommend to do this is create a separate CSS file and say this is my adaptive CSS file. So this is the file where I decide how it changes based on you know, the content, uh, based on the size of the device. So I'm just going to add a new um, style sheet. I'm going to call it adaptive. And I'm going to cheat and paste in a whole lot of stuff here. So this isn't complicated. All this is doing here is saying, um, here's the media query. Um, I want it to be for a screen. And if the screen's maximum device width, device width, so not the width of the screen, but the device width is this, then I want you to make, and all I'm doing is making the title red, right? Just to identify it um, between the different devices. The rest of this at the moment is just how big, how wide is the viewport? So how wide is the screen? Um, and there's a few different things. We change the layout once it gets to a certain width and um, you know, full-size desktops. All we're doing is changing the background color as we get, as we get higher and higher. Um, I'll get to the bottom stuff in a sec, but um, I just obviously need to add this reference to um, the style sheet here. I really hope I've got that. Hey, there we go. So um, I'm adding the style sheet to the layout so it's going to come with the page. And you can demonstrate most of this on a browser because all it's doing in, for the most part is changing the color. So you can see it's a certain width. So it's popped the menus down to the left. And this is just a CSS change. It's changed the background color. And as I make it smaller, you can see at some point it changes color because it's hit a certain boundary. And if you make it even smaller, we've decided that we don't have room for the menu anymore on the left, so we're going to pop it back up to the top. Um, and so on. You'll see that the title here is um, still white. It hasn't changed to red because the device itself is wider. So this laptop and this projector is wider than that. However, if we have a look on the phone, I'm just going to refresh this page. Oh, crap. I'm just going to refresh that page. Um, I'm going to go to the bookmarks and I'm going to reload that page. There we go. So we can see we've got the color change. So we've got that brown horrible color. But the title is red because it said the device width, not the page width, but the device width is less than 550. And we can see this happens when we um, put him on landscape as well. We get another change of color. So it's changed to this, to this color here. So with this kind of stuff, you can, um, you can really tell it, you know, based on the size of the browser, I want you to move stuff around and change the CSS. And that can actually be quite powerful, particularly if you don't know all the devices that are going to be using your application. Um, the last part of this is um, there are other things you can do with these media queries. So you can tell it if it's a portrait, a portrait device or a landscape device. Now, on a browser, that means is the height more than the width or vice versa. But on an iPad and a phone and things like that, that'll translate really nicely to landscape and portrait. So um, I'm going to jump past that a little bit just because, again, running out of time. So here's the plus. It's supported by almost everything. Um, every mobile device that you have will support CSS3 pretty much. Um, so you don't have to worry about, oh, is this Android version X going to work? It generally will. Um, you can change the layout without changing your content at all. So you can say, like, a, like we did, that menu is now, has now got enough room to go on the left, so we're going to do that. Um, so you can get some pretty powerful results out of this. The downsides are you need a good structure already, obviously. There's only so much you can do with CSS, particularly if you've got a horrible mess of HTML which sometimes happens, um, there's not, you cannot do everything with CSS, right? So you've got to understand that, and it, it needs a bit of a good structure to start off with. And again, this survey page is still going to break it because it's a table. You're not really, I mean, you could put, apply a class to that table and change the width of the class, but it's still a table. It's still this you know, big, long chunk of content. 
The other thing is, not only are you sending the same content that you would send to a browser, you're sending more content because you're sending these adaptive CSS classes, right? And if you do a lot of work, depending on how big it is, they can get quite big. You know, you can do a lot of reflowing depending on how wide the thing is. So it's worse than before. You're not just sending the same content, you're sending more content just to cope for mobile devices, which you should be sending less content to, ideally. So that's CSS media queries. That's, it's, it's not a bad result if you want to make it look a bit nicer. But the ultimate way of doing this is user agent sniffing. So um, all the web developers would hopefully be aware that when you visit a site in a browser, that browser has a user agent string which it sends to the server and says, this is who I am. Like, this is how I identify my browser. And it's got words in it like iPod and um, iTouch and all that sort of stuff and WebKit and things like that. So what you can do is you can look at this user agent and you can decide what you want to send. Which, which makes it, you know, gives you the ultimate power, basically, in terms of what, you know, what to deliver to the, to the browser. Now, MVC4 has a lot of the stuff I'm about to show out of the box. There's some great mobile view engines. So out of the box, it'll know, oh, this is a mobile device. I need to send that here. I need to send it this content. But MVC3, um, there is actually a... Uh, a nice uh, NuGet plugin from uh, Scott Hanselman and a couple of other people, um, which will let you target mobile devices with a different view engine. So, if you haven't heard of NuGet, really, really use NuGet. It's fantastic. Um, it basically lets you, um, you know, get packages that are embedded into your application, and updates the packages, and it looks at their references and what it requires and so on, and updates them as as you go. It's it's very powerful. So I've just got a local feed because I'm not on the internet. Um, so what you're looking for is this mobile view engines, which is MVC3 capable mobile, mobile view engines. So what it does is when, it's, when MVC decides what to send, it has a look at all its view engines, how, it, how it's going to send stuff out, you know, how it's going to choose a view to send it. And it lets you do things like, oh, well, if this is a mobile device, then, send, then use this view instead. That's all it's really doing. Sorry, did that make sense? I just realized I've... So this is going to go away. It's going to grab all the references I need. It's grabbed a couple of other requirements. And it's built these bootstrappers to attach the view engines. And it's built some specific view, engi view engines as well. You generally don't need to touch them. Um, but what we can do now is in our survey view, we can create another version of this index, uh, sorry, another version of this survey index, which is the thing which had the big table. And we can say, I, I want a mobile version of this. So we copy this. And the convention, and this will carry through to um, MVC4, I really hope, um, is .mobile.cshtml. So index.mobile.cshtml. And I'm going to grab um, all of this and get rid of it and replace it with something that's a little bit nicer for um, mobile devices, and that's a list item. So um, when I visit this on a page now, sorry, I'll visit it on the browser first. So when we visit it on the browser, we should see exactly the same page as we had before because we're not getting this mobile view. We're getting the view that we started with. Um, so when we go to this surveys page, great, we've got this table here. Um, and I'm missing something. Here we go, there's a demo fail. So when I go to that on the mobile device, I'm getting the same thing, which is not what I want, obviously. Um, I thought I compiled it. Oh, no, that's deliberate, okay. No, no, I'm serious, it actually is deliberate. I, and I always forget, every time I've run through this talk, I've thought, oh, that's right, after sitting there panicking about why it's not working. Now, MVC does not see the, view, the uh, user agent from my phone as a mobile device. It's fairly primitive, which brings me to my next item here, which is another um, NuGet package called 51 Degrees. Now, 51 Degrees is built on an open source uh, WURFL um, project, basically. And all, all it essentially is, 
is a gigantic list of all of these user agents and what the capabilities of that, um, of that object are or that user agent device thing are. So if I include that, it's put a whole lot of stuff in configuration and so on, and now it's going to detect this as a mobile device. But one of the annoying things that 51 degrees, the new get plugin does by default, is it will do that really, really annoying thing where you visit a specific page on a site and it redirects you to the home page of the mobile site. You know, have you ever done that when you click on a link to a browser and it goes, oh, you're a mobile device, we'll um, you know, redirect you. So I'm just going to take out that gigantic chunk of redirection, do a recompile, and then hopefully when I refresh this, we get, if this fails, it's a legitimate fail. The last one was, was deliberate. There we go. So now it's seen this, and it's gone off. <laughs> OK. So now it's seen this, and it's uh, gone, oh, well, I know this is a mobile device now. Um, so I'm going to give it this list. Um, now, I could go on with this and start talking about jQuery mobile and so on and formatting these lists to make them nice for devices and so on, but hopefully you've seen how that behaves in the mobile agenda for DDD, so m.ddd.com. That uses jQuery mobile. Um, but you can get, you can see here that it's targeted, you can see here that it's targeted this device specifically with a separate view to say this is what, this is what you're getting. Now, as I said, MVC4 will, will work out of the box with this .mobile. Um, and both of these, both the plugin and MVC4, will let you inje inject your own view engine. So what you can do is say, if this expression holds, so the user agent has iPhone in it, then here's the view prefix that you want. So the typical example would be, if it has iPhone in your user agent, or iPod, or whatever it is, um, then I want you to use the iPhone prefix, right? And say, um, so it'll look for index.iPhone.cshtml um, instead. And to do that, you literally just need to inject a new view engine, oops, which is a little bit of code there. So you're saying insert a new view engine Look for iPad, and here's your condition that the user agent has the word iPad in it. And then if there is a mobile template that says index.ipad.cshtml, use that one, otherwise fall back to the other ones. So you can, what you can do with these things is you can slowly build up these more and more specific pages for certain devices. So you might get a complaint from somebody saying, oh, hey, my obscure version of something or other doesn't work with this page. So you can build up a page for that obscure version of whatever it is based on the user agent if you really want to. Um, but the important thing here is you're sending the specific content to this browser that you would otherwise. Because you're building a new view here, you can tell it to use a different layout. So you could set all your mobile um, items to a layout, a specific mobile layout. Um, now, unfortunately, you have to do that in here by telling it this is the layout you're going to use. In MVC4, you don't have to. The layouts, by default, instead of by default it using underscore layout, it's going to use underscore layout.mobile.cshtml. So you can do this in one, you know, in one hit. The other thing that MVC4 will do is um, it will, sorry, I've just lost my train of thought. It's going to um, let you write these, um, well, it lets you write these view engine conditions out of the box without having to install things. Um, you know what? I'm going to come back to that. I'm sorry. It's been a long day. I'm going to remember it as soon as I, oops, as soon as I start doing this. So basically, the idea here is that you are looking at the user agent or looking at the condition of the, the um, device itself, and you're saying, here's the content that I'm going to deliver you, right? It gives you the best results because you're targeting content specifically to that device, um, or 
you know, the capabilities of that device. So you can send a lot less stuff. You can skip your JavaScript completely if you really want to. You can only deliver a tiny little package of CSS. Um, so you're sending less content. Unfortunately, there's the most effort. Obviously, you've got to write versions of your page for every device that you want to specifically target or every you know, condition that you want to specifically target. And the other thing is it needs maintenance. Now, it's great that it uses this WURFL thing, but if you deploy this into production, um, it comes alongside a browser, um, like a library of all the different user agents and the browsers and, and the capabilities and so on. And if it's in production for three years, you've missed out on three years of devices unless you update this file continually. Because it's WURFL, you're not tied to a recompile and things like that. You can just replace a file and it'll sort itself out, which is good. Um, but ultimately, that's, you know, that's the real bonus of this kind of thing. So, yes. You, you can, yeah. So um, what this um, 51 degrees thing does is it basically extends your uh, request.browser object. So by default, that's fairly... It, it gives you a little bit of information about the browser, but this one will give you things like um, can initiate voice call, can render... I don't even know what most of these things are, but... You know, can render mixed selects, can render this stuff, can run JavaScript, can do all this sort of stuff. So you can do it based on these things. This line here, or this bit of code here, is really just a Boolean condition. It's a, hey, if this stuff is right, like, you know, when I'm deciding whether to give this view engine to, um, you know, to this page, check this stuff out, and if it's right, then, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to match this, this um, view engine. So you can do anything you want here, really. You can say if it's between 5 and 10, give them a completely different view engine to say, we're closed at the moment. Um, so yeah, excellent. So hopefully, I have demonstrated that mobile is important. It's important to give the best you know, result. Um, and some of those statistics at the start hopefully would convince you of that. Um, hopefully, I've showed you that uh, Entity Framework plus MVC gives you MVP, or it gives you a, a really quick way of building up an application from nothing to here's something you can use and it has authentication, it has authorization, and it has um, you know, these objects and this whole database structure and, and you can build this stuff up. Um, and finally, I hope I've showed you um, the different, some different ways of targeting mobile devices. And I would honestly recommend doing these in order if you have a site that doesn't you know, it doesn't do this. Number one, and you can do this tomorrow, go and put this viewport meta tag in and just have a look at your phone, have a look at your site on a mobile phone and see if it looks better. I mean, it's, it's generally as long as you've got some kind of template page, it's one line of meta tag and it doesn't make any difference to browsers, desktop browsers, but it may improve the situation for mobile browsers. Um, the next step is maybe some adaptive CSS. So if if you're working with a really narrow screen, maybe you don't need this whole queue of social media tags at the bottom. Maybe make that bit hidden. So, you know, it gives a better result of that kind of stuff. So that would be step two, I'd say. So based on, you know, how big the device is, whether it's in portrait or, or landscape, how much screen real estate you've got and so on, change your CSS, change how it's laid out. But finally, the most powerful way is really based on user agent sniffing. And MVC gives you some great stuff, particularly with the, uh, the MVC4 stuff. We'll give you this stuff out of the box. Um, but if you don't have that yet, then that 51 degrees and also the uh, mobile view engine um, you get package um, is really powerful that, for that kind of thing as well. So before I go, uh, we tend to do this. Three little things. My name, email address. Um, we're always open to questions and um, clarifications and all sorts of stuff. Um, my private website, which is a blog that gets updated about as often as blogs tend to get updated, which is not very often. And I'm on Twitter at Demo Visa. I used to have a fourth one on here which said, come to DDD Brisbane, but you're already here.
Great. Thanks, guys.